Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Terrain 3D 0.9.3a has been released. The A is a maintenance release, so if you don't have that version, make sure to pick it up. I haven't done a tutorial video since February, so I have two releases worth of updates to cover. The first two videos are still relevant, so I'm only gonna cover the new features and things that have changed. At the end of the video, I'm gonna share some special announcements that you don't want to miss, some new things that are coming out this quarter, so at least skip to the end before you leave. The first big change is that Terrain 3D is now in the asset library. So you can download Godot and install Terrain 3D in just two minutes. You can still download Terrain 3D from GitHub, or you can open up Godot, click on the asset lib tab, type in Terrain 3D, click on the one for your version, and download it. Make sure to download the demo so you can use it for testing and troubleshooting. One of the biggest changes to Terrain 3D is that now we store our data in a directory instead of a single file. Our documentation walks you through the upgrade process. One of the key things is deleting the old plugin before installing the new one. After installation or upgrading, make sure to restart Godot twice and make sure you have enabled the plugin. If you click on Terrain 3D and don't have a toolbar or an asset doc, then the plugin is not enabled or properly installed. Click on Project, Project Settings, Plugins, and make sure Terrain 3D is enabled. There is an upgrade path, so you can upgrade your data. Although this upgrade path is laid out where you can jump versions, if you have trouble with that, try upgrading incrementally and saving along the way. In this release, we have greatly expanded support for mobile platforms. We don't have a lot of mobile users at this point, but it is pretty much supported. We actually have one developer who's not just playing his game on Android, but he's actually developing inside of Godot and Terrain 3D on his Android. So support is coming along very well. We also do support the compatibility renderer. There are some bugs in Godot that you do need to work around, and we have instructions for that, but it does work. Direct3D 12 is broken in the engine. There's some artifacts there. Uh, MIP maps are not generated properly. Once they fix that in the engine, we'll be able to support Direct3D 12. Metal, I have no testing reports, so if you have an OSX system and want to test out Metal and let us know how it's going, we'll appreciate that. We can update our docs and maybe troubleshoot some issues. Speaking of documentation, our documentation system is now versioned. So if you click on the menu, either down in the lower right-hand corner or over here, you can choose the version that you're on. Stable is currently on 0.9.3. Latest is our development version. So make sure you're using the correct documentation for the version that you are using. Next, I'll call your attention to this page, the games using Terrain 3D, where you can browse through some of the games and demos that our users have been using. A lot of these are still in development, so give them some slack. If you want to get your game added to the list, contact me on our Discord server and we'll get you set up. Make sure you have some sort of social media presence for us to link to. Next, this new page, user interface. I want you to pay attention to the keyboard shortcuts. Some of these are now necessary. The control key is necessary in order to remove things like regions, color, and foliage. There's a lot of new pages in this version, so I encourage you to go through all of the documentation and at least get a sense of what is here. And if you're new to Terrain 3D, make sure to read the introduction page where I've written about the concepts of how this system works. One key concept is that of region. Regions are the spaces where we can sculpt in. And speaking of regions, I shared with you earlier that we now store our data in a directory instead of a single file. Every region is its own separate file. This allows us to bypass some bugs in the engine and finally support larger terrain sizes. And we've introduced the ability to change region sizes. You can access this in the region size dropdown. Note there is no undo for this option. If you change it, it's going to slice your data. Yes, you can re-slice your data back to the previous. However, we still have maximum outbound limits. So if you change region size down to too small of a size and bring in the outbound limits, it will cut off your data. And the only way to undo that is by reloading your scene. So with these two changes, the separate files per region and the ability to change region sizes, we now have the ability to support terrains as small as 64 by 64 meters, all the way up to 65,535 meters on a side, or 4,290 square kilometers, which is roughly 32 times the size of the Witcher 3 map, and about 37 times the size of GTA 5. Now, you're likely to run out of VRAM before using all of that space, 
but we're already looking at the ability to stream regions in and out of memory. I do recommend smaller regions. Separate files makes Terrain 3D friendlier for teams and Git users. So multiple people can work on the terrain at once without conflicting with each other. And they're uploading smaller changes rather than the entire terrain every time. In Out of the Ashes, we size down to 256 meter sized regions. I also added the ability to see region labels and even draw a grid on the ground so you can tell exactly which region file you are editing. Here is 00, which corresponds to this file 00. And here is 0, negative 1, which corresponds to the file underscore 00, hyphen 01. The people on my team are able to identify the exact file they're using and upload that and only that file to Git without guessing about it and without conflicting with other users. Smaller chunks allow the engine to occlude them through occlusion culling or frustum culling, and it lays the foundation for streaming regions in the future, which will save on both RAM and VRAM. If you want to see what's in a region file, just double click on it. This data is read only, so you won't mess it up but you can change it through our API or through our tools. Next, we have a detachable, manipulatable asset dock with a lot more features. You can move it to any sidebar you like or move it down to the bottom, or you could even detach it by clicking this button over here and then move it around. You can pin it and this window will always be on top, or if you close it, it will go back to where it was. Click on textures to see the textures and meshes to see the mesh assets that you have. And of course, you can resize. Notable feature changes in the texture asset is that I'm finally satisfied with detiling. This used to be called UV rotation. Previous versions of it were unusable in my opinion, and now it works pretty well. Very minor performance cost. If you're enabling detiling and noticing that this pattern appears in the reflective quality or the normal, what you need to do to fix that is reimport that normal texture in our channel packer and enable the orthogonalize normals option. That will recalculate the normals in a way that will allow us to rotate them as we do for detiling. Next, we've added a foliage instancer so you can paint grass, flowers, bushes, rocks, pine cones, and other things on the ground. It supports using either texture cards or you can drop in meshes. Click the foliage tool and click to add it. Control click to remove from the ground. One key aspect I'll point out to you is that there is a visibility range of 64 meters by default on these assets. So if you're painting on the ground and you can't see anything, it's probably because your camera is outside of the range. So you can either move in the camera so that you can paint or right click the mesh asset to change the features of it, increase the visibility range to much further away, or you can decrease it down to zero to disable the visibility range. This might be useful while painting, but in game, you probably want to have this at a reasonable level. We've broken up instancer data into a grid of 32 by 32 meter cells. And you can see it here. This instancer grid is a debug view you can turn on. Breaking it up this way allows us to control the visibility of these cells based upon either distance or frustum culling or occlusion culling for greater performance. You can see here it pops in. If you want to remove the pop in, Edit the material and enable the distance fade. And you can see it fades in and out. And the instances that you've painted on the ground will adjust their heights based on sculpting. Note that every mesh has a height offset that you can change here. And this affects the placement of all instances. You can also override the height offset when you paint right here. However, when you re-sculpt the terrain, it's going to default to the height offset that is stored in the mesh asset over here. We don't store the height offset per instance, so we can only use the height offset that you have specified in the mesh asset. Now I want to draw a distinction between the two types of 3D objects we can have on the ground. One is what I'm gonna call mesh objects, and the other is what I'm gonna call instances. Now, confusingly, if we drag this object onto the ground, and you can see here it's a static body, if I open it and click on this object, you can see over here, Godot calls this a Mesh Instance 3D. If we search in the help for Mesh Instance 3D, you see it comes up with two types of objects. Here, this first one is a Mesh Instance 3D, 
and the second is a multi mesh instance 3D. So although the names are very similar, the multi is a key aspect. They work very differently. The mesh instance 3D, I'm going to call mesh objects. Meshes that are part of a multi mesh instance 3D, I'm going to call those instances. So we have objects and instances. Instances draw many meshes with one draw call. So you can get better performance with mesh instances than you can with mesh objects. However, mesh objects allow you to manipulate them after you've placed them on the ground. So they both have trade-offs. Another aspect of mesh objects and mesh instances is that the instances, while they will respond to the ground, mesh objects won't necessarily do so. However, we have built in a special tool that allows you to adjust the heights of mesh objects while sculpting. And if you add in a train 3D objects node and any mesh objects that are children of this node will respond to sculpting on the ground and it will adjust their heights. On Out of the Ashes, we use a lot of both. We instance smaller meshes where we want to have a lot of them like grass, small bushes, small rocks, debris, pine cones, twigs, small plants. And then we use mesh objects where we want to place large things like trees and rocks, things that we know we want to have collision on, although we will be adding collision to the instances in the future if you want them. But mainly we use the objects if we want to manipulate them after, like we place a tree and we might want to add on a root system onto the tree or we want to move the tree around later as we adjust things. Basically, if it's an object where we're going to have smaller number of them and we want more control over them, we're going to use mesh objects. If we have meshes that we're going to have many, many instances of them, we're going to use instances. Now you can place them within Godot and use the standard Godot level design tools. Although, as I've talked about in the past, we use Asset Placer. It is a commercial plugin. We feel it saves us a lot of time, but I understand commercial plugins are not for everyone. Next, I'll point out that the toolbar on the left has changed. We've removed some of the negative only buttons like lower. Now, if you hold down control, you see that the buttons change to the negative equivalent and you need to use the control key to remove or inverse the operation that you're doing. A lot of these tools have an inverse operation. Not all, but a lot of them do. You can also press shift to switch to smooth and alt for a couple other modes you should read about in the user interface document. Down on the bottom, there's a lot of tool settings that have been added, and I want to go over some of these that are not obvious. A lot of these tool settings act like a filter. So texture allows us to filter by texture. And if I disable the texture, that will turn it off so that I cannot paint texture. That's useful if I want to paint only the angle and the scale. So if I increase the scale, and with texture disabled, now I can just paint the increased scale without affecting anything else. Or I could paint at an angle. And here's what enabling the dynamic angle option looks like. You can see it changes based upon movement. Uh, it's not perfect, but for a path, like a cobblestone path, this works quite well. You can also use the pickers to identify the angle that you're currently using so that you can paint that area The slope filter allows us to paint based upon the slope of the terrain. 38 degrees matches pretty closely with the slope used in the auto shader by default. And you can press Alt to invert the slope. And a lot of these features work the same on some of the other tools. And you might think that the slope brush would be useful for holes and navigation, but trust me, it won't. Here's what happens when we use the slope brush on color. It's fine for coloring and texturing, even painting foliage. However, you do not want a non-contiguous hole or navigation mesh. It's really no big deal to just paint the hole where you want it so that you can make sure that it is contiguous. You don't want to have random faces in the middle of your hole or your collision shape. And you can explore the different instancer options that are available in the menus here. Note that you can click on most of these labels to reset them to default. A lot of these boxes, you can increase the value far greater than the range allows you to do. 
The range is a reasonable range that most people want, but the boxes allow you to input a value that is even greater where it makes sense. These settings are saved across sessions. If you look in editor, editor settings, and come down to terrain 3D, the dock and the tool settings is where we store these settings. And then config is where we have our options. There's the alt key bind for Maya users. All of our brushes are alpha stamps, so we do have limited support for alpha stamping. And here's how you can do it. Let's make it a region. I have a 1024 sized region. Let's turn on the grid so we can see where it is. I'm going to select on the add or raise tool. I'm going to choose one of these options. Let's do this one. I'll increase the size to 1024. And I'm going to turn off jitter so it does not rotate. I'm going to disable aligned to view. And then I'm going to increase the strength up to, let's say, 10,000, which should give us a maximum height of 100 meters. And then I'll line it up as close as I can. And then I'll do one click. And after a few seconds, there we go. So with this particular brush, that's all right. But I probably want to increase this particular stamp up to maybe 30,000. And then we'll click again. And in a few seconds, we'll have a much larger thing. Okay, that's probably too strong, but I might go down to 2,000. So you can explore your brushes if you go to the add-ons in Terrain 3D and open up the file manager. In the brushes directory is where we store all of the EXRs. Anything smaller will be upscaled to 1024 by 1024, and, and we'll use anything larger that you put in. However, note that all of these textures are loaded, so they do take up a lot of VRAM. Don't load up too many textures that are too large or you'll have a problem. We've made a lot of progress on Terrain 3D. We have a lot more work to do. If you are a contributor and want to help us out, look at our issues in our roadmap and join our Discord and help us to continue pushing the envelope on Godot Terrain Systems. On to announcements. I have three of them to cover. The first is we're finally going to have a downloadable demo for Out of the Ashes. We've been working on it for years. We had a major setback when we went from Godot 3 to Godot 4. A lot of the plugins that we used didn't work. There was no terrain system available for Godot 4 when we started. So we had to create our own. So we're finally gonna show off a little segment of our world. We still have a lot of work to do. It's unpolished, but we're gonna give a peek at something that you can download and play with. So look out for that release in November or December. We're going to let people that are on our Discord server download it first, so make sure to join up so that you can get it. Next, we're going to be releasing a downloadable Terrain 3D demo that is created by a very talented 3D artist named Frank, so that you can download and see what Terrain 3D can really do in the hands of a talented artist and something you could do as well yourself with the right setup. He created an island inspired by Iceland. Here are some pictures of it in progress. You can see his Twitter page here. They're working on a game called Taverna, so make sure to give him a follow. Look out for that release in November or December. Thanks for making the demo, Frank. Finally, what's coming up in December is we're gonna release a new open source plugin. It's called Sky 3D. That is a day-night cycle plugin. It comes with a beautiful sky, fog, clouds, beautiful lighting setup. It's the lighting and environmental system that we use for Out of the Ashes. So I'm excited to get it in other people's hands and getting some more contributors to help us improve it. But already I'm very happy with the results that we're getting from it. So look out for that release date coming. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure to do all the things like subscribe, follow me on Twitter, join our Discord, and we will see you in the next video.